Welcome to the Self-Defense Warrior Podcast, where our hosts, Jeffrey Wilson and Pat Militich, probe the minds of experts from a vast spectrum of knowledge on how to best prepare for the inevitable emergency situation to come. Jeffrey and Pat and the Self-Defense Warrior Podcast are your insurance policy moving forward. And now, here they are, the hosts of the Self-Defense Warrior Podcast, Jeffrey Wilson and Pat Militich. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. A little bit of joking around here before the launch of the next episode of Self-Defense Warrior, the 360-degree view of asymmetrical self-defense. And, of course, joined as always with my co-host, by my co-host, Jeffrey Wilson, the the brains behind the operation. How are you, Jeff? Well, let's 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 not get crazy, shall we? Let's not get crazy. But you know, as always, fun, always awesome to be riding shotgun with you. Um, I've been wanting to speak to this gentleman. I mean, I've spoke to him before, but I've always wanted to him speak to speak to him in a more official capacity to record what he's been up to. He's one of those I like to call these uh, alchemical agents of al- altruistic agents of alchemy because he's transforming human beings' lives. And there's not a lot of people that can say they're doing that. He's not necessarily turning lead into gold, but he's he's helping people basically you know raise their consciousness and help change the quality of their life and again there's not a lot of people can say that they're doing that and we're going to be talking about a lot of stuff that kind of we're all going through and how to try to maintain sanity in an insane world but even in not an insane world just every day just ways of psychological spiritual self-care very very well said very very well put uh so yeah our next guest Graduated from Purdue University around 2008. And he also wrestled at University of Purdue. After that stint, then trained with me at my gym and became quite a quite a good uh, accomplished MMA fighter. And then one day he walked into my office and he said, "Hey, what kind of chance do I have to win a championship in this?" And I said, "As good as any that I've seen." And he said, "Because I've got a chance to go get my master's degree." And I said, "Well, that's not a really a difficult choice. Getting punched in the face or getting a <laughs> master's degree, you should probably go get the master's degree," so, which he did in economics from George Mason University. He's now a motivational speaker, a mindset coach, and an amazing hypnotist. He's done some some really cool stuff, and I've observed that and actually experienced it myself once in the past, and I'd love to do that again. So our guest, Nick Spahn. Welcome, buddy. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. That was quite the introduction. And, uh, and Jeff, I really like that altruistic, alchemical, whatever, whatever you whatever Al- you said. Altruist- that was really good. Al- alchemical agent of altruism. I love it. I love that. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to start using that. That's triple good. A, baby. Triple A. The real triple A. We've been waiting to do this podcast for a while, so I'm I'm excited to to be on here. For sure. Awesome. And so, I see it as there's two sides to everything. There's there's good alchemists and there's bad alchemists. There's folks that are throwing out incantations for for the negative, all over the media, constantly programming people, and then we've got people like you that are unprogramming and reprogramming people, their subconscious and helping them to be successful in life, get rid of depression, a lot of other things. So, you know, talk talk a little bit about that and, and how that process works with the subconscious a little bit. I wanna dive right into it. Yeah, so alchemy was always just a metaphor of turning kind of base emotions into those higher emotions, you know, lead into gold. And it, it wasn't necessarily metallic, it was the metaphor of, of transformation, right? Transforming something of a lower nature to a higher nature. And for me, you know, my journey was facing my own insecurities and my own kind of failures and weaknesses along the way. And every time I'd hit one, I'd, I'd read, I'd learn from some of the masters and I'd overcome it. And then I'd go on to the next thing. And I'd I'd hit a wall with my, uh, you know, in mixed martial arts, Pat, and I had a guy like you to take me to the next level. And so every time I hit kind of these emotional insecurities, I would find a new technique or I'd find a new pattern, a new way through it. And after a few years, you know, that was kind of based on, um, just my real estate business and entrepreneurship. And after a few years, I realized, you know, I've actually gone pretty deep in a lot of this stuff and I'm, I'm starting to, people are starting to listen to what I say and I'm starting to get results, just giving people new insights. And so I, I kind of put together a framework of how to use our mind and our thoughts to, to create a life that we want to create a life that's on purpose instead of having it dictated to us, um, by the media, by our culture, by our society, by our parents and by our fears. And so that's, that's kind of what I do is I show people their patterns and help them decide new and empowering patterns. Okay. So when we talk about say triggers, so there's, there's triggers for everybody to a certain extent, if they've had some trauma in their lives, you know, for instance, 
uh, riding in a vehicle with a combat vet. And when there's traffic issues, he gets boxed in by other vehicles and stuff because the IEDs that he experienced, the explosions, the injuries, you know, his friends being killed and injured, uh, he gets really uptight, really uptight. And, you know, there's things like, for me, when people scream at me, because I got screamed at a lot as a kid, by, mm -hmm. as a kid, that I just don't tolerate it as an adult. And I've tried to set boundaries and let people know, hey, I'm not the one you want to be yelling at. <laughs> let's let's cut that off. So, you know, talk a little bit about triggers and on, uh, deprogramming those types of things. Yeah, so triggers aren't even necessarily bad. It's just a, a response. The, the brain is a pattern matching machine. And so what happens anytime there's a heightened emotion or something that gets repeated, those are the two ways the brain gets programmed. It starts to make a meaning of that situation and says, oh, people that yell, you know, when I get yelled at, I'm in a dangerous spot. I need to feel this emotion to compel me to take this action. Or when I'm trapped in a vehicle, this is a dangerous situation. Whether it is or not, the subconscious makes that meaning if we don't consciously decide. Um, but again, you could play a song on the radio that triggers a positive emotion, right? The, the subconscious doesn't discriminate between that, that good and bad. Whatever emotion is there, it links up. So it links up anything that happens in a heightened emotional state. And, you know, I guess my work is just how do we figure out what those triggers are and then go change them? Beautiful. Jeff? Well, and it's just one of those things that I'm not, you know, I'm glad we have you on here. But it's one of those things I heard. It's like whether it's a PTSD wartime thing, you've been traumatized as a child. We all were downloaded into our operating system from whatever it is, zero to seven the operating system that we were pretty much going to work and play out from seven onward. So it's, it's, it talk, talk to us about that, if you will, your, the, how the operating system is downloaded from that zero to seven into your subconscious. And then for the rest of our life, we're just playing out good or bad, whatever that, that operating system was that downloaded. And when it comes to things that are toxic or not necessarily beneficial to us, how rewriting or relearning or retraining, whatever the term is, our, our unconscious mind, um, to, to changing certain behaviors. Yeah. So there's a lot there. So first of all, it, it sometimes it even happens before we're born, right? This is epigenetics. If our parents have a, yes. a strong emotional event or a strong fear that gets coded into our DNA and we come into the world with that. And then you're right from zero to seven is basically hypnosis. That, that critical factor that, um, decides, do we want to take this on as a belief or not? That's not there. And so we, we, in that state, hypnosis is a, a heightened state of learning and focus. And so from zero to seven, we want to learn as fast as we can to be able to make it in this world, right? So everything we hear, everything we experience becomes part of us from that zero to seven. So we can have our best chance of survival. And it takes a lot to go back and, and to change that. And those programs often last people's whole lives because they don't learn any different. So as a child, if they see their parents uh, fighting or they see uh, one of their parents using anger as a strategy to get what they want or protect themselves. Guess what? That child in that moment, it can happen more, you know, it happens often multiple times, but it can happen in a moment where they learn anger is a strategy for me to use to, you know, reclaim my power or to, to, to draw a line in the sand or to get what I want. And so boom, that's born. And, and then that lasts consciously they're like, I don't know why I'm getting angry, but the subconscious is like, look, anger is a tool for us. Let's use it. Right. That subconscious doesn't, there's no discretion there. It's just using what's programmed emotionally. And the most important program from that zero to seven that we all have is how we get loved and accepted. Uh, so for some of us, we have to avoid our parents because we're going to get, you know, abused by them. For some of us, we have to perform or we have to be funny or we have to be attractive. We have to be all these things. And so from zero to seven, we start to learn and, and some people, they can throw a fit and they get love. Right. And that program then lasts off in the rest of their lives. So from zero to seven, we have this, how can I get loved and accepted? Because that's my source of survival. That program starts to set in. And for most people, it, it carries with them the rest of their lives until they can really become aware be that self-awareness, right? Know thyself, start to see those patterns then you can go back and you can change that. And we can talk about that next, but, but let me ask you guys, if you, if you have any questions, if that made sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, it, I, I wanted to ask you about the epigenetic side of it too, because not only do we get stuff downloaded as, as children, like you said, but DNA has, and I don't know the full quantification of the terms or whatever, but DNA remembers. And, you know, it's definitely passed on when you start talking about like generational trauma, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's definitely real. 
Well, yeah, it's not like a crazy concept. Let's simplify it. I mean, a bird can build a nest and they didn't go to, they don't have a degree in nest building, right? They don't get a, they don't go take certification programs or whatever. Like they just know because the DNA over thousands of years, every time a bird puts a piece somewhere and it's like, oh, this is how I should build it. That makes sense that they kind of have a little bit of emotional program. Boom. It sticks in the DNA. Uh, and then that gets passed down as instinct. And so we all have the exact same thing. Um, most of ours are, are pretty similar, our instinctual responses, but they can be very different as well based on where we were raised, our, our, our lineage. And so, yeah, it makes a ton of sense that we would have emotional responses that our ancestors had. Well, and think about, you know, when we talk about, I mean, this podcast, the Self-Defense Warrior podcast, right? So humans are the only animal born on the planet with no self-defense instincts born into us as well as generally the types of beliefs we're going to have religiously, you know, a, a lot of different things, our opinions and things are molded by what we learn. It was never born into us. And humans literally are void of so many things when they're born compared to, you know, wild animals. Yeah. And that's our greatest strength and our greatest weakness, right? If you look at a crocodile, um, if they see their parents, they're going to get eaten by them. And so they're like, they're on their own from day one. And I think that's why they have such a bad attitude. Us humans, on the other hand, us humans, on the other hand, our, our survival mechanism, our competitive advantage is that we're loved and we're taken care of so our brain can develop. We can take our time with, our, with all these very complex patterns, uh, all this uh, infrastructure for language to be built and body language and movement and complex planning. That takes time and a lot of evolutionary resources to build. And so we can't go – be the crocodile and survive on our own in the beginning. And so again, Pat, that comes back to that. The most emotional thing we do as humans is learn to get love. And so from that zero to seven, we're subconsciously seeking like, okay, I said this and everybody laughed and they loved me. Let me do that again. Or I, I spilled the milk and I got yelled at. Let me, let me make sure I don't, I don't do that again. And then I'm afraid of messing up. Um, and so we all, and two people can have the same responses and make totally different meanings of that, right? We all make a meaning in our head of a situation. One person can get pushed around as a kid and think I'm weak. Another kid like you, Pat, can get pushed around as a kid and think that's never going to fucking happen again. I'm going to whoop somebody's ass, right? Uh, <laughs> yes. But it's just, it's the same situation, but we make different meanings of that. And, and those meanings create our whole life. And so as adults, we can look at our, our emotional patterns and say, wow, I get really angry in this situation. Or you know, when somebody stands up to me, I like, I back down and I get anxious and I get fearful and we can generally, and this is what I do in hypnosis. We trace that back to what's called the initial sensitizing event. And we found where someone made a meaning that then constructed their whole strategy for living going forward. Mm. And we change it at that young age. And then we can, and it usually collapses all of those patterns going forward. Sometimes we, we, rehearse, you know, throughout the life, live your life as if that didn't happen when you're young, live your life as if that was actually a blessing in some way, this, this thing that you thought was a trauma or a negative event that you learned from it. How would you apply that in your life? See yourself living your life and then see your future with this new pattern, this new meaning. And because the brain doesn't know the difference between something that's real or imagined, we can use our imagination to imagine ourselves behaving and being in a behaving in a different way and being a different type of person. And if we practice that enough, it just becomes who we are. Does that make sense? Fake it, fake it till you make it. Sort of, but, but yeah. faking it implies that you're not feeling congruent with that. But if we do it in hypnosis where you can actually step into that imagination, and this is a, this is a good segue. So, um, beta brain waves is when you're living your life and, and the re what's on the outside seems real. Alpha is when our subconscious and our, and our conscious mind are, are communicating and, and your internal pictures, you can start to make them into reality. And that's where we get creativity, but theta brain waving brain, brain waves is that's where that zero to seven, right? That's when you're getting hypnotized as a kid, that zero to seven, you're in theta. And it's the same when we do hypnosis and right as we're falling asleep and right as we're waking up, we're going into theta. And theta is where what's on the inside, the pictures you're making, your imagination is more real than what's on the outside. And, and so when you do that, that's when you start to experience it as you and you feel, oh my gosh, like I, I am this person. I feel that confidence. I see myself speaking. And I know Pat, we talked about you visualizing uh, fighting right in the cage and 
in your imagination, that was more real than wherever you were sitting on the couch or laying in bed or whatever you were doing. And because you did that so much, you just became that type of person. Does that make sense? Sure. Visualization uh, is very powerful. Yeah. So, and, and hypnosis is really just kind of guided visualization in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and that changes the meanings that we've made on, on important life events. It changes how we see ourselves, which is the self image, which is kind of the foundation for how we perform in the world. So that theta from zero to seven also forms that center of the universe feeling where you see a lot of people that think they're the center of the universe. And I catch myself all the time being the center of the universe where we look at people who in positions of power, say for instance, who are demonstrating they're the center of the universe or so they think, right? And how they are capable of selfishness, um, greed, you know, all these different things where, you know, the, the, that all of that came from because when I cried when I was a little kid, I got picked up. When I was hungry, I got fed. You know, when my diaper was dirty, it got changed. You know, cry, response, cry, response, all of that. And then we build that pattern going forward into life. And it's amazing when I reflect on my life, I've, I've been wearing a diaper for years, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing you mean that you have the same patterns as when you were a child, right? I've, I've no, I've, you know, I've grown a lot in terms of observing and, and it's that growth out of a lot of stuff that's painful, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and sure. getting through all of that stuff can be, can be exceedingly painful. And we see a lot of people that are not, you know, not necessarily growing out of things. They're not changing. They're not questioning their beliefs or anything like that. And they're just, they're staying the same, uh, mainly out of fear, probably. Yeah. And so for starters, you have to have a desire to change. You have to have a desire to improve and to get better and to really look at your beliefs and say, is this true? How do I know this is true? Does I, do I want this to be true? Many times those people who have these limiting patterns or, or these fear patterns, they think they're correct. And so they're not even questioning, <clears throat> you know, they're not even questioning, am I right or not? They think every time they get angry, they're, they're just right. And I, when I get angry, I'm like, what is this about me? That's getting angry. Like what? you know, what's the program that I'm running here? And I look at myself and that's where you can make change. And so that's the number one thing that someone has for me to even work with them. They have to say, I'm, I'm responsible for, for my life situation. And I'm willing to question my beliefs. I'm willing to question my programs. I'm willing to really look at why I respond this way instead of blaming my partner, blaming the government, blaming, uh, you know, any, anything you think of the, the president, um, saying, what is it in me that's feeling like a victim? What is it in, in me and in my background and my meanings that's, that's making me feel this way? And that's really the, that's really the start of the conversation. When I think one of those terms, and I'm sure you've probably heard of Eckhart Tolle, um, yeah. he, he talks and it was, it's very, you know, over the years of reading his books and understanding his work where he talks about your life versus your life situation. You know, and not to get too deep into it, but this is just kind of what he says. Our life, our life is where infinite conscious awareness, our life situation is our marital status, our job, I'm whatever external thing that we tend to make validate who we truly are when ultimately that's just an illusory status. When in fact, you know, our life is, you know, like I said, it's, it's way bigger than our life situation. And what do you find with a lot? I mean, because you really and that's what's so cool. I've been wanting to talk to you about this. and I really want to partake in one of your trips to Sedona because that's one of my favorite places on the planet. When you when you start getting these people out there, are they are they out there trying to better their already coolness? Are they recognizing that they have holes in their game and they want to stop doing X, Y, Z situation to reach this kind of next level of enlightenment? What are you finding that most people when they're going out to these retreats, what are their not specifically what are their issues, but I'm assuming they're all trying to get out of their own way to some degree. Yeah, of course. Uh, and, and it's various, a lot of, I work with a lot of entrepreneurs and I think it's a combination of like, okay, I'm really cool in this area and I'm a total loser in this area. And right. I think that's, that's kind of the human experience. So when I do events, I think one of the coolest things that happens at them is people share their experiences and they go, you know, someone might get really vulnerable and say, you know, when I was, when I was three, I had this, this really bad thing happen to me. And I always, I never feel like I'm good enough because of it. And I look around the room and I go, and they're the only person that never feels like they're good enough. Right. And everyone kind of laughs because that's the human experience. And so right. they see this person who had that experience, although I didn't have the same experience, I do experience the same emotions. And this person who's super confident, I see myself in them 
in certain situations and this person who's really anxious and this. And so they start to see all of their, their patterns in these other people mm. and, and the group kind of like gets super connected because of that. Um, but yeah, they, they want to learn how to use some of these strategies and language patterns to influence others. Uh, and guess what? The keys to influencing other people is the same as influencing ourselves and, and changing our own programming. And so we do a lot of work, like I talked about going back into the meanings that they made early on in life and the values and rules that their subconscious program is using to, to basically construct their world and their perceptual filters. So everyone, as we've seen in COVID, everyone has different perceptual filters based on their life experiences. So, you know, the three of us generally have similar perceptual filters about the whole COVID thing, but we go talk to somebody else. And they have a totally different 180 degree different experience of COVID than we did, right? They and I'm not even going to share our, our views. I'm sure. Everybody no, knows. but I, the problem is, it's okay. difficult to it's just difficult to hear them through their mask. <laughs> yes, yes, and but we can say like, okay, based on their upbringing, their the way that they relate to authority, uh, you know, the the media they're consuming, they're constructing something based on their beliefs. And then once they believe that, they just go out into the world, they'll find the scientific studies, they'll find the experts, they'll find friends that all confirm their views. And so COVID just made that more obvious, but we all do that all the time. We're always yeah. out there confirming our biases. We're looking yes. through, at the world saying, it must be this way because this is what I believe. And I'm going to find the scientific data to show it. Right. Um, and, you know, I've, I've kind of been experimenting with some different uh, diets and I'm on the carnivore diet right now. And I've, I've kind of done vegetarian or vegan as well. And I'm, I'm watching videos on this and I'm seeing, you know, I'll watch a carnivore video and in the comments, Oh my God, I just stopped eating vegetables. I feel incredible. Two years, no vegetables. I feel so good. This meat diet is amazing. And I'll go read the, the vegan videos, the comments. I stopped eating meat two years ago. I've never felt better in my life, right? All those meat eaters are total idiots. Yes. And I'm like, how, how can we, like, how can we have such total opposite views and everybody's having a different experience of like, you know, something as basic as what we eat because we're filtering the world through our, our beliefs. Yes. And it's so important. Once you understand that you can say, Oh, he's not really angry. He's just filtering the world and giving this experience meaning. And when you do that, you can start to relate to people because you know, they're just, they're responding with a program with a subconscious program. You've been listening to the Self-Defense Warrior Podcast with Jeffrey Wilson and Pat Militich. Watch the complete interview on Red Voice Media Premium using the link below, completely uncensored and ad-free. Not a member yet? Try it for a buck.